just want to uh, comment that what we're talking about, uh, what Clinton aid uh, during the Clinton administration was called, is the economy stupid, uh, and that that resulted into the global financial class collapse. Uh, so it just wasn't the economy; uh, it's how you think about something. And you know, the word here is it's the system, stupid. You know, it's how do we change a larger system of many levels and we have to start distinguishing our levels and the tools and remedies at each change vector. So yes. Peter, you are, you are trying to leave, then perhaps we can schedule our next one to continue the discussion. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Gimme uh, Gelgelu, uh, uh, I, I think, wanted to interject some things. Uh, he, he had some perspective on some stuff uh, as well. Uh, Good. Bernard here, I've got some thoughts, but I'm very happy to leave this to a later session. Okay. Go, Gimme, go ahead. I was actually, uh, this is actually fascinating to hear. Can you guys hear me? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Oh. yeah. It's fascinating. All the presentations are actually absolutely fascinating and I was quite interested and quite riveted by the presentation we just completed. Um, I'm curious, the, I'm wondering the premise of the, especially when you are presenting, um, the presenter just finished, I forgot his name, um, um, I apologize. Um, when you were presenting the, you have one side, the countries that are happen to be uh, African descent or, or black led countries and what their status is. Is there any background as to, or any data that you're using? What may let, what led to the countries to be destabilized and maybe not at the better position as uh, they should be? I'm pretty sure that was a predicate to the subsequent ar argument that you are making for the status of black and the United States. It's bullshit, in my opinion. Ghana is an excellent functioning democracy in the middle of Africa. It doesn't have to do with black or white, where the people are able to run a democracy. So I would also cite Botswana. I understand it's a very civilized country. Yeah, why wouldn't you? There are white countries like Belarus, which is not a civilized country. It doesn't have to do with black and white. I would okay. second, yeah. I, I agree with Lut, and I also would add, Jason, I'm surprised you didn't say anything about the colonial history of these countries. Because South Africa, that's coming from an apartheid regime. And I had to deal with that. So, so there are extenuating circumstances. And all the other countries, they've had different colonizers. And, and there is some sort of an effect. And I think at the minimum that should be acknowledged. And now what Lourdes says, there are a lot of dictatorships that are completely white. And they're I've, not- I've, yeah. I've spent I was seven- trying to, I was trying to point out the culture. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it, it's not a, a lot of, it's not about a color, but it's about a culture and how people work together, how people organize their society. Uh, I've spent seven years looking at the American Revolution. And there were two revolutions in America. One was against physical oppression. We had a war against it. Uh, it concluded in 1781 with the Paris uh, Peace Accords. In three years, the country fell apart. It was going a separate way each colony. It was only the second revolution embodied in the, not oppression, but tyranny, which deals with the symbolic systems. So when you're looking at half revolutions in Africa, they s took away their tr traditional op oppressor with white faces, and the black faces then learn the lessons even better than the white faces of how to oppress. The issue then is how do you get a complete or whole revolution that changes the way 
the population sees. And so I don't think it's cultural. It is an incomplete revolution, an inadequate notion of change and how we have changed in America versus other areas that have, that have not changed even though they changed the people and the faces. It's about power and powerlessness. And there are incomplete revolutions. And just one example in America, Cesar Chavez had the boycott of the lettuce and grape growers. Uh, we may have better porta potties out in the fields for the Hispanics, but not much more. In the black movement, they worked with the notions of the Constitution, with the American experiment, and what it meant to be an American. And this idea of reciprocal liberty, that I cannot be all that I can be until you, white boy, are still as good as, you know, to, to get this reciprocal. It's a whole system. And so I think it's not cultural, it's an incomplete notion of, of culture. I think we need more analysis than these type of... Uh, so in a in a uh, in a group situation, uh, different people may start speaking on different levels. So it, it usually high frequently we run into something called uh, uh, a chicken talking to duck. So so they they are they are different things in people's mind, so they speak at different level. So the group discussions efficiency usually uh, very low, very poor. So this methodology uh, twisted this natural process a little bit just by implementing a rule of the game. It says, okay, we need to share all four levels of our uh, personal view. Uh, on all four levels, and we do one level each time. So using this method, if you practice a little bit, your group conversation efficiency becomes uh, much more improved. So, so to memorize it is the first is the what level, and the second is the gut level, and the third one is the uh, 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 so what level? It's, it's, it means we, we start using our brain to do the analysis. And the, the last one is now what level though? So what, what new decision I have been made after today's uh, discussion? So today our plan is to follow up uh, last meetings, uh, three presentation by Jamie, by Peter, by myself, and uh, we are supposed to discuss a reaction uh, of those uh, um, presentations. But today we got a new friends coming, uh, Peter from, from uh, Peter Karariani uh, from Boston. And uh, we have Bob here. Uh, and we have also Valerie was here last time. And uh, who else? Uh, so, so the new friends can just uh, uh, gradually listen, or, or I assume if you already seen uh, some of the videos that I posted earlier, so you can also jump in at all, whenever you 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 like. So, is that clear already? Yeah, yeah. So, so why don't we start from the data or what? level to share what we have what I have heard last time uh, during three uh, presentations after a few days of memory uh, shrink what do we still remember can we share about that uh, we can we can do on a sequence of one table of the uh, of my screen. The first one is Jamie. You're, you're muted. Yes. Um, what I do remember is um, um, this Peter's 
about, uh, of course, my own presentation, Peter's presentation, yours, and then uh, Lowell's comments, uh, how we pointed out uh, that uh, we were uh, working at different levels, uh, complementing one another. Um, for instance, is that Peter was uh, talking about very concrete actions today that anyone immediately can take while I um, was like biased uh, by my background I guess uh, I used to teach strategic management so I was more kind of taking a little bit of a system perspective without using the term system uh, trying to understand so what exactly is responsible uh, for uh, the current division and I kind of put it all on the feet of the machine metaphor and, and a lack of understanding how uh, metaphors actually work. So I'll uh, rest my case here. Thank you. Peter? Peter Lewis. Uh, you, you're muted. Gotta have two seconds to do that. Uh, well, for I think just about everyone is here that was here last time, but a uh, couple people I think are new, but um, in my uh, presentation, which was entitled uh, Perspective on Black Lives Matter from a firsthand witness to and victim of systematic racism, um, basically uh, I went in and talked about the BLM Black Lives Matter background, the founders, uh, what it stood for. Um, and then went into uh, systematic racism that I've personally witnessed from a child, uh, not so much recently, but uh, certainly uh, like everyone in the room here has seen uh, uh, indicators uh, that prompt up the Confederacy and uh, racist type uh, physical statues and things of that nature. But more recently, I have not um, witnessed and been the victim of as much systematic racism as I was earlier uh, in my life. And that, that alone uh, is an indicator that things are better. And then that led right into uh, my next slide, which was based on the fact that I asserted, uh, although may, some may call that an ipse dixit, an assertion made but not proven, but, uh, but at any rate, I attempted to discuss why I felt that the majority of the United States is not bigoted uh, based on the fact that uh, Obama was elected to the presidency. That couldn't have happened if, uh, you know, 60 or 70 percent of the country was still in the Jim Crow mindset. Um, uh, and also, when I looked at the fact that I felt like a minority in most of the marches I was in on Black Lives Matter after the uh, um, you know, murder of some of the more recent uh, black men and women uh, going down Wisconsin Avenue from Friendship Heights to the National Cathedral. I was kind of looking around you know, to see if there were any more black people. Just about everyone there was white. So all those sort of indicators uh, certainly showed me that people are less conscious uh, and concerned about the pigmentation of someone's skin uh, as opposed to their brain and what they offer to make a contribution to society. Uh, and then I went right into Black Lives Matter today uh, and discuss the fact that I felt that it has grown way past what the three original founders of BLM uh, ever envisioned when they started this movement back in 2013. Uh, it has evolved to, you know, uh, you know gay, lesbian, uh, queer, trans, um, um, uh, equality, uh, uh, not just racial equality, also gender equality and religious equality and things of that nature. So I think it's grown to mean, at least in my mind and a lot of the minds of the people that I've discussed this with, uh, that BLM today uh, represents essentially where we should have always been as a society and that is equality for all. Um, and then I went into what I felt were some uh, solution set um, uh, items such as uh, physical displays of diversity on all fronts, jobs, advertising, uh, real inclusion, the fact that still there are some uh, hiccups out here as an example, 0.8 to 1% of Fortune 500 CEOs are black. And I discussed the fact that the, that was a dismal three out of 500. Uh, same when you look at the Fortune 1000 and 2000, it doesn't get much better. 
Uh, same thing with board members uh, on these firms uh, or within these firms. And then I uh, wound it up with uh, sort of actions against racist organizations and people and behavior like business boycotts, uh, including uh, some uh, against companies like Domino's and Home Depot that are uh, staunch supporters of uh, Donald Trump. And I think that uh, uh, regardless of what party uh, he is a member of, and I have a lot of Democratic, liberal, and uh, conservative uh, Republican friends, uh, and, but people that support if Biden and Democrats were running around with racist rants and code words, then I would uh, be a staunch Republican right now. I would not support someone like that. And uh, But I felt that those sort of uh, actions, uh, like boycotts and op-eds, and other means of expressing public disagreement are certainly proliferating. Um, and that kind of winds up uh, what I talked about. Cool. I remember a lot. Uh, Valerie, what's your- I wasn't uh, here. Okay, huh? maybe, I, maybe I, did, I, yeah. I didn't participate the last time. Oh, sorry, okay. Stuart. Maybe, maybe I would like to add something. Uh, Peter, you gave an introduction that I just felt I, I couldn't, if, because you, you have experienced it in the first person and I just have witnessed it, but it's not the same thing. And um, so I, I, I thank you for, for giving this much better introduction than I did. Okay, I so then maybe what I was trying to up to the conversation is as Peter said, he doesn't believe that there is really this virulent racism, I think, that's what you're saying, but there's something else going on and, and trying to give a name to that something else. And so I was just hypothesizing uh, that we are dealing with some uh, metaphors. Uh, one is the great chain of being uh, that is really pitting us against each other. And, and the machine metaphor is another one in that it set up the distinction between superior and inferior machines uh, just from manufacturing. You're and so that we to... really need to work on our educational systems to, uh, to kind of create a much to the third level. how to work metaphors and not to become their prisoners. Is that a, a good summary of what I was trying to say, Peter? No, no, no. I mean, I mean, you, you jump, we are, we are doing four runs. You jump into the third level already. Uh, let, let's share the data first. Uh, Stuart, you are not. You haven't. You haven't uh, share yet. You you are muted. And this is Peter. Before Stuart goes, I just want to say I think Jamie was just basically just continuing and add uh, adding more to just the summary of what she talked about. Uh, wasn't trying to jump the gun to number three. I heard yeah. some analysis. That's okay. <laughs> we cannot be perfect. Uh, Sure. That's why you need a yardstick so you can slap our hands with the yardstick when we uh, mess up. I cannot do that. Uh, the <laughs> Indian people will have a talking stick. Stuart, talking stick. Yeah, well, uh, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and so uh, racism was very much uh, an issue there. Uh, my parents made it clear to me that I was not supposed to associate with uh, Blacks, Hispanics, and Catholics. I mean, you know, uh, or Jews for that matter. Uh, it was uh, sort of a Protestant neighborhood and uh, I never really understood why, but uh, uh, any case, that, that, that was what was expressed to me. And then I think I, I wrote a memo to everybody after the, our first meeting in which I described my experience in the oil fields of West Texas where I was working with some roustabouts, uh, white laborers. And once they were joking about going coon, coon hunting and I looked at them <laughs> sort of uncomprehending and disapproving because I, I knew what that meant. It basically means find some black person and lynch them or at least harass them uh, and give them a really bad time. And uh, I think when they, they noticed my facial expression, the conversation stopped. But uh, that sort of stuff was going on back in the 60s. And as we know from the front page, it's continuing up to the present time. Uh, ideally a lot less, or fortunately much less, 
but it was very much a part of the American experience, um, sort of reasserting white superiority after the Civil War. So that, that's dated. your that that's your memory in your own um, in your own experience. Uh, we are sharing what have you heard, uh, Peter, Jamie, and me talking in our presentation last time. How 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 much do you still remember? The, I mean, the facts sharing, right? Well, I agree with Peter that things are much better now than they were. I mean, fortunately, uh, things have improved a lot in the last 50 years. <laughs> that's, that's not a really great speed of change, but at least it's going in the right direction. And certainly Obama's uh, election as president is a very good indicator of the fact that, that there has been progress. So. Lower? Lower? Yes. Uh, I heard from you, Jason, uh, the concern of the true believers and mass uh, organization, um, and that you're seeing tendencies in the society and certain instances you can see in the news media of not just trying to change the system, but the violence that, that, that's occurring. And that mob behavior, particularly in your uh, clips about what happened during the Great Leap Forward in China. Um, so I heard that as a concern and as a counter to the empathic presentation of the violence and pain that uh, we have all felt um, when we are a minority or in some forms oppressed. What I haven't heard and what I hope to be hearing is more of what are the tools of change and what do we mean by systems of change? Mm. Thank you. And uh, for that's first run. Uh, second round is about uh, our gut. I think Peter had something to say. Oh, continue, please. Um, I just want to say, um, I also grew up down south. Um, my father got his first job at Ole Miss, and we were there when Meredith enrolled, and um, then went to Memphis State. And so I grew up in, in Oxford, Mississippi, and Memphis, but my parents were Yankees and Catholics, which were also hated by the KKK. Um, so um, I've all, I, I thought of racism when I was there. I was very contemptuous of Southern society because 90% of them don't believe in evolution and they're basically crazy. They're almost like Trumpists, you know, before, way, way before Trump. They're George Wallace, they've all supported George Wallace. So um, in terms of what the problem is about, I think roughly about 30% of the American population is consciously racist. Uh, and, um, and there's another segment that would just rather avoid things altogether. Uh, and I think and I've been tracking uh, the Black Lives Matter movement for a bunch of years now. Uh, and, and there are divisions in what to do about it. Um, uh, and there, even in the civil rights movement, you know, there were divisions between black nationalists like Malcolm X uh, and uh, Martin Luther King, who had a more universalist, assimilationist uh, goal. Uh, and the question is, what, what is the nature of the goal that we want to arrive at? What kind of society do we want to arrive at? Do we want to arrive at one where people are uh, equal and, and race no longer is a constraining factor in people's lives and life choices and possibilities? Uh, or whether we want um, there to whether we want to support different groups like the identitarians basically want to do, you know. Um, so I think that there's a, a possibility of a non-identitarian uh, progressivism in which uh, we strive for equality of, uh, between um, races, ethnic groups, religions, you know, sexualities, sexes, et cetera, et cetera, um, without, um, without the sort of tribalist um, um, parts of that. Um, I can talk more, but I, I don't want to monopolize it, so. 
I've been Wonderful. trying to sort through these these issues of race, and I found that the the consideration of caste in India is very useful in that regard. The one takeaway I had from our discussion last time was, and I've heard that again today, is the movement today is much more about identity. I mean, before black is beautiful, that was a form of identity, solidification, sense of agency. But today, when I talk to my Republican friends, they are aggravated by this identity politics. Me, 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 look at me, I'm gonna change my sex, I'll be doing this. And that's really different than the uh, civil rights movement of the 60s. And uh, I worked with uh, Miles Horton at Highlander Research and Education Center in, in Tennessee. And that was sort of the strategy planning development for Abernathy, uh, Martin Luther King, Andrew Young, etc. So like Rosa Parks didn't go to the back of the bus after she did, went I, two years, summers at Highlander. But the, the idea there was not identity, even though that was important for the movement, but it was the ideas of reciprocal liberty. And, you know, the Martin Luther King said it best, I cannot be all that I can be until you, white boy, are all that you can be. And that whole idea of reciprocal liberty is a radical notion versus hegemonic liberty or the today, the NRA, natural liberty of, you know, hold my gun or the law and order of the Puritans up in the Northeast where you change by changing the laws. So that idea of reciprocal liberty was something that helped found this country and also what helped found the civil rights movement based upon the founding of this country and the constitution. That was the strategy then versus the straight identity politics of today. And uh, so we have two different strategies here. Paul, oh, you want to say something? No, I'm just uh, thinking about when I moved from Chicago to to Charleston when I was eight years old, um, I was the, there were no blacks around in Southern Charleston. I was the Yankee kid. Um, and I remember uh, being de-pantsed on the public playground once or twice just for being a Yankee. So um, that's part of my personal experience. See, uh, Bob's, uh, what Bob just said is an example of uh, uh, memory and uh, uh, associations, feelings. So, so uh, by hearing what we just mentioned, uh, caused him to uh, to associate with uh, those uh, memories he just mentioned. So we are now in the. Uh, I'm still trying <laughs> to. Uh, mm, practice this. We are now in the second level. Second level is about all about the emotions and the feelings. So who wants to start? Well, I'll uh, say a few words about, about that, you know, in the presentation that I just summarized uh, and when I gave the presentation a few days ago, um, you know, I, I uh, uh, had one slide, if you all recall, that had a dozen or more um, instances uh, where I had, you know, suffered uh, a racism, everything from being beaten at Shepherd Elementary School, which was 99% Jewish as well as our neighborhood. Um, but I didn't mention to you is the exact reverse. When I went from sixth grade and was now ready to enter into seventh grade, and we started at uh, Floral Street Northwest and then Shepherd Park neighborhood uh, just to the uh, one block north of Walter, the old Walter Reed Army Hospital. Uh, then I had to go to Paul Junior High, which is now 99% black. And Frank Gibson and my Jewish friends from uh, Shepherd Elementary, that because of their zip code or because of where the boundary was, they then were assigned to Paul Junior High, as opposed to Deal, um, which was just, you know, all white. And, um, and then Frank was beat up. We were walking to the, get the bus in Missouri and uh, 
George Avenue and these uh, five or six black guys descended down from the hill, told me to get lost. And I said, what do you mean? They said, we're going to beat him up. And I said, no, you're not. So uh, they shoved me out of the way and started kicking and stomping and, and beating Frank. Um, and, um, you know, he wasn't hurt in a major way, but they punched him, you know, bloodied his mouth, all that kind of stuff. So Mr. August Savage, we used to call him Augie Doggy, was the vice principal of Shepherd, And Mr. Zevin, uh, both Jewish, was the principal of this 99.9% .9 black school. And that's the way things were in DC. They were the regulators. And I got along with Mr. August Savage and Mr. Zevin. And August Savage came to me and said, you know these guys, so I'm gonna walk with you in the hallway and you're gonna point them out. So Frank and I pointed each one of them out. August Savage took each one of them to the office, told us we had to watch while he uh, administered disciplinary action. And he began to just punch the hell out of them in the stomach, one at a time. And he was like, like this, okay, Mr. August Savage, I won't do that again, like this. <laughs> and it was just physical, absolute corporal punishment. But one thing is for sure, there were no more instances of, um, of these uh, kids attacking, you know, white kids that year when they knew they were going to come under this bulldog vice principal uh, that administered his own justice. And I agreed with it, uh, I have to say. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say that, but I thought what he did was great. I, I never will forget those days sitting in his office watching him punch the hell out of the stomach and take the breath away from those idiots that beat Frank up. And, um, you know, but it was just the 180 degrees opposite. So uh, I, when, I, when I gave that laundry list, it doesn't mean it's not the other way around too. Uh, there are some, a lot of unforgiving black people, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that, that won't look the other way. Uh, and I tell them, don't keep playing the race card about every damn thing. Don't, don't blame it on race when you get fired. If you were just an effed up individual and screwed up your job, then you should have gotten fired. And, uh, you know, it has zero to do with your skin color. On the other hand, in some cases it was. So, you know, it goes both ways. Uh, Lowell last time, uh, you know, after my presentation said, well, good, that hits on part of it, but not the whole thing. And I agree with him. Uh, you know, we haven't gotten the solutions and, and, and the what if, as uh, Jason put in his uh, email that went out to everybody. So what now? And I don't want to jump the gun and go and be in violation of Jason's orderly manner here. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not sour. I'm not bitter. Uh, I don't carry a chip on my shoulder every time I see a white person. Uh, when I started Cellular One, which you, you all know, I was one of the founders of the first cell phone company in the United States, you know, and Cellular took off and grew, and now everyone's got a cell phone. Uh, Cellular One is now AT&T Wireless. So they bought it from us, me and John Kluge and Catherine Graham that owned the company, and uh, they gave us a, a bunch of money and all that kind of stuff. But one of the people I tried to do business with was Emery Fulmer, who was then mayor of Montgomery, um, Alabama. At the same time that I went to visit Emory a month before Time Magazine, either had him on the front cover or one of the main articles that said something to the effect, is this the most racist man in America? And I went down to meet Emory. And when I went, he had his mayor's limousine pick me up and we were gonna talk about him raising a few hundred thousand dollars for the legal fund and the engineering to get Montgomery done. On that same day, Jesse Jackson was meeting with uh, George Wallace in that famous meeting. It was uh, the same day. So Fulmer, they accused him of being a racist because one of the Montgomery County cops shot a black kid in the back that had robbed a delicatessen or a bank or whatever. And they said that he sits there, you know, in his desk, hunkered around the Bearcat scanner, police scanner, listening. Uh, and then he ordered the police to go, hey, go, go out and kill that kid. And first thing Emory did when I walked in the office, he grabbed me by the arm and said, look, this, I said, so where's the scanner in your office? He said, it's right there. He said, it's got an inch of dust on it. He said, it's not my office. I'm not sitting there waiting to order the police to go kill black people. So anyway, we had a fun conversation and whatnot, but it was kind of ironic that, that the same day that I'm meeting with him, he's also in Time Magazine and captioned as the, as the most racist man in America. 
But one thing I found when you're doing business with people and you're making them money, all of a sudden, color pigmentation, gender, uh, you know, whether you're gay, straight, and all, all that goes out the window. And uh, that was the more amazing thing that I learned that when I was helping people make millions of dollars, they did not give a shit as to what color I was to use the best business <laughs> technology I can come up with. So I just wanted to just toss that out there, you know, uh, you know, because mindsets change based on personal gain uh, and whatnot a lot. And then they go back to their racist way after you make, help them make a couple million bucks. And, uh, you know, so it's pretty amazing to see this. As they flip flop back and forth on their attitudes. First, they're smiling in your face and whatnot. And this black, this young black boy from DC helped me make a bunch of money as an owner of Cellular One in Montgomery. And then on the other hand, they're using the N word to their friends over dinner next week. Go figure. So Lowell, I don't know how to answer my own comment. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, Jamie, yes. mm, emotion, association. Jamie. Unmute, Jamie, unmute. Yeah, yeah. so you're asking about my gut, and so I've been trying to connect. Guts, emotion, and uh, association, like just uh, people <sighs> offered us. Gut emotion association. Okay, uh, an association that came to me is maybe the following. For me, a, a profound event, if I remember it correctly, was in the fourth grade. Uh, design from Belgium. Belgium at the time I was there is 95% Catholic or maybe 99%, and it's white. Now we have a, a, a guest worker population from North Africa. Um, and in Antwerp, where, I'm, uh, where I was growing up, uh, there is a large Jewish population. But uh, at the time that I was growing up, uh, I didn't really uh, uh, make itself uh, visible uh, in, my, uh, in my little life world, so to say. Uh, but we had uh, a black girl in our uh, this Catholic school. And uh, that may have been a profound moment. But I have to make a confession. Uh, there was something happening on the playground and I did go to the teacher and I said, this black girl did this to me. And she immediately said, I couldn't use the word black. And, um, and so that somehow has stayed with me. Uh, I guess in, in the back of my mind is why did I do that? And, and I did it because it was a way to differentiate and I guess so it had nothing to do with, I mean, okay, so I guess that it's like maybe that's influenced my current thinking uh, that I realized I, I didn't know her. It was just a very convenient way to, to kind of separate her and I thought it was going to work, <laughs> but it didn't work. Uh, but, but I figured out, are there really racist people the way it's being um, uh, uh, articulated in, in much of the identity politics literature or is it more that people are just uh, frustrated or angry or, or they want to just blame someone else and, and they use some convenient uh, characteristic um, and then uh, they run with it uh, something as easy visible uh, for other people to to um, to to run with and so um, so that is, if anything, that is the way my, my, my gut revealed itself. But I also have to say I was heavily influenced by growing up as a Roman Catholic and believing in a, in a, in a world where everyone loved each other. So, so there may be other people that, that have a much more uh, different uh, growing up where they don't think about getting along, but, but they they have had different experiences. Does I always thought like, what is it that prevents us from getting along? And and other people are maybe more like, what allows me to survive in a world that doesn't want me? So I, I'm, I'm not denying those other experiences. Actually, that's part of my gut that I learned. Other people have very different experiences. And, and this is the last thing I will say, uh, but what connected me and Jason is to pursue some argument that says, no, Immanuel Kant, you are wrong. 
we're not all rational actors and variations of the same. It's like uh, Emmanuel Levinas is saying it. We're all unique and different 7.4 billion unique people. And there is something that allows us to connect. And so what is it that allows us to connect? So, um, so that's what I'm uh, interested in now. Uh, just to acknowledge that everyone has a very unique experience, but to find out what is the common humanity that we have, and then actually to connect to something that Peter said, and I said, well, I go to biology, and biology proves the point. As long as we can mix our genes, and we produce children and grandchildren, then we have something in common. <laughs> and we need to focus on, on whatever it is that we have in common. And as long as we do that, eventually things will work out. Thank you, thank you. Stuart, guts, memory, association. Let somebody else go first. I'm, I'm not too clear uh, on the category. Laura, Laura, your turn. Un unmute yourself. In 1967, I chose a college, Vanderbilt, to get out of the Midwestern syndrome and go to the South in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I was a jock. On our floor, the uh, KKK put things under our doors at Kissam Quad, which uh, you know was relating blacks to apes and all that type stuff. You know, uh, the. Vanderbilt had the first uh, Southeastern Conference basketball player, Perry Wallace, who was excellent. And one of the things the group started to do is over those four years, the changes that happened in perception and perception changed via interaction. One of the things I created there was the Free University of Nashville my sophomore year. We had about 500 students in it doing short courses with Vanderbilt, uh, Peabody, and Fisk, which is a black institution. Uh, and we would have people giving short courses uh, on a variety of subjects outside of the traditional academic. And, you know, by the, at, when I graduated the next year, we had the first black student president. And the changes that occurred in four years, I mean, we had women's standards committee, so the women weren't seen to have shorts during the week or chewing gum on campus, to having co-ed dorms at the end of my senior year. So the changes that happen in institutions can only come about through by changes in perception and exposure. And how do you get that exposure is, was my lesson from being in the South and having some pretty rampant racism all around me. Valerie, you want to say something? Uh, I come from Maine, <laughs> which is 98% white. <laughs> and uh, is this, this part of the conversation is very interesting to me because you've all had um, experiences at very young ages. And part of my growing up years in Portland, I knew only one person of color and when I say color, that person, uh, even though her father was Jamaican and her mother was white, uh, she did not consider herself uh, black or a person of color whatsoever. So my mother had to not explain things to me, but, <laughs> but just refer to some people are darker than others because of the sun. Um, so I really um, had no experience in the way that you have experience. And the other time I became um, aware of black people was actually as an undergraduate at a university. And again, not very many at all. In fact, I knew of only one person uh, who was black. And this person was very much of a novelty. Uh, so those emotional uh, experiences that many of you have experienced is just totally, totally gone for me. Here in Maine, in the last 15 years, though, we have had an influx of, um, of people from Africa, particularly Somalis and Ethiopians. 
and they have settled in two different communities in Maine. But it's very interesting. Um, the communities are very, uh, they keep their communities very, very tight. There is not a lot of interaction with white communities whatsoever. Uh, so even some of the emotional experiences that you're talking about still haven't been um, available to me. But I will say this, I just finished reading Devil in the Grove. I don't know how many of you have read that book. It's about Thurgood Marshall's strategy, uh, to which finally ended up with uh, Brown versus Board of Education and desegregating education. But that was a very emotional experience for me reading that book, I have to say, um, because I did not realize how much uh, particularly in Florida, where, where this book takes place, um, how much Blacks were still thought about in the same way that ha they had been thought about 100 years previously. And the fact that lynching still took place in Florida, never mind some of the other states too, during the 1950s, and not much was done about it. But it was an emotional experience for me to read that book and to realize, oh my good God, and to also question how much further we have come uh, since the civil rights times. I think there was a very high expectation uh, from the, the, uh, the 50s and 60s about um, progress for minority people in general. Um, I don't think those expectations have been realized even today. That's why we're having these kinds of discussions and why we have Black Lives Matter. And I'm just wondering, Lowell, I have a question for you. Uh, you referred to talking about tools and black identity now and what have you. Do you see anything in the, um, in the um, black, uh, in the, I'm sorry, identity pop, uh, politics movement right now that can provide some tools about going forward in a positive way? Um, because I don't see what happened during the civil rights years actually being an alternative for most people at this point in time. So just curious about that. Okay, so if not uh, more sharing on the gut memory association section, we will mm -hmm. enter into analysis. Just a uh, okay. uh, very <laughs> question and uh, Law is going to answer with analysis, I guess. Do you want me to give a presentation? Uh, <laughs> presentation, you can, we can finish the full end and then you okay. can do your yeah. presentation. But you currently, you just uh, back to uh, our full level. Uh, in answer to Valerie's question is, we've dealt with the physical manifestation of oppression lynchings, uh, at least we've reduced the incidents, etc. But we've not dealt with the full revolution of tyranny over the minds of people. And that tyranny is a cybernetic problem. Okay. Because it is a problem of the organization of our symbolic world, our perceptual world. The, uh, we talked about brains and neurons, et cetera, like that, but the problem with science is that it looks at the specifics. It doesn't look at the fact that you and I are talking now and the fact that we have a communications culture between us of a common language, certain experiences that are different, but we can get around that. If we were talking as I was earlier today with Stuart, with folks from Russia and Slovenia, you know, we're dealing with very different languages there. Um, but they, they share certain characteristics being Westerners. Uh, so I, I think the fact that we've dealt with the physical oppression and it's only in those institutions like force, you know, the Newtonian world, the police force against force, that it's still so resident and so uh, apparent. But it's in the minds of the people. It's like the UN Charter. Uh, if war starts in the minds of men, peace must start in our minds too. And cybernetics should be able to address that issue of minds and the organization of symbols and narratives and the ability to see. 
cybernetics is a perceptual science, not necessarily a conceptual science of the brain. So, Sorry for, for so you analysis, say analysis, please. Yeah. Valerie? Well, no, it was to follow up. Um, you say it's a cybernetics problem. What can cybernetics actually do on the ground uh, to address the mind problem? That's uh, fourth. That's fourth level. Let's see. Oh, sorry. Okay. Level. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm ahead. I'm ahead. Sorry. I'll go back. Okay. Forget it, Lola. I'll catch you up yeah, next at to, level four. We have one more run to go. Uh, Peter, <laughs> uh, uh, Peter in blue shirt. <laughs> okay. oh, we sorry. have two Peters here. So. Um, you know, uh, Pew Research. Uh, uh, who you are most likely familiar with, uh, did an analysis uh, using Crimson software. Uh, and the, the purpose was to determine how many times uh, on Twitter uh, since uh, 2000, uh, you know, uh, 13 or so when Twitter started and also when Black Lives Matter started um, as to how many times the term was used uh, in order to kind of gauge uh, you know, how often is it seen in the household and around America and corporate life and elsewhere? Uh, and they determined uh, using Crimson software that there were 30 million uh, uses of the term BLM or Black Lives Matter on Twitter uh, up to uh, just recently, which is about 17,000 or so times per day uh, when you divide that out by the number of days since then. And, uh, and that's quite a lot. Uh, that means that the uh, um, you know, when, when looking at, you know, how do you um, use cybernetics uh, to evaluate, you know, what the societal impacts of BLM are, uh, what good can come out of it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that first is a prelude to that and foundation. I think Pew Research offers some good foundation, uh, just knowing uh, that it's on the tip of the tongue with everyone, either they're talking negatively and saying Black Lives Matter is a radical uh, organization um, and that white supremacy is way down there, but Black Lives Matter, all these people are essentially domestic terrorists. Uh, you got that one camp um, and, and they're talking about BLM on Twitter in a negative way. Uh, you download a CB radio application on Android or Apple and they're using the N-word and BLM in a very negative manner. So at least on Twitter, uh, you have just because it's on Twitter doesn't mean it's being discussed in a in a good way, uh, but, but it's being discussed at both extremes. And um, so um, I don't know how you break the log jam, you know, uh, between the people that say BLM is good and the other extreme that says BLM is bad. Uh, I happen to think it's good uh, Jamie and some others here have expressed the fact that they think it's good. Uh, where cybernetics, you know, comes into play here, um, I'm not really sure. Uh, but one thing is for sure, it starts with groups like this, I think, and just discussing and understanding it and, uh, and, and trying to propagate the results of whatever we come up with out. So I think it's important that, would, uh, that there be some sort of conclusionary um, summary that's in writing. Uh, posted uh, on more than just Columbia Remy, but out there on social networking. Uh, we'll leave that up to Jason to decide and to do. But uh, uh, that's where it makes a difference. Uh, I think people want to uh, want uh, to know why they should support BLM. Why, why should they depart uh, their current negative thinking of BLM, which is very isolated, and why some others um, that support BLM uh, shouldn't at least see some of the argument and some of the fears that people that don't like BLM and think it's terrorist, what are those fears? What's their rationale? And to start that discussion with them through social media. Uh, that's, how you, that, that, that's how you essentially, you know, uh, combat racism. That's how my dad got Mr. Thompson at 1209 Floral Street to finally talk to us after a year after we moved into our house. He kept every day like I told you when I presented every day, he went out when he, he watched by the window as we were cooking dinner. As soon as he saw the door open and the back door of Mr. Thompson's house, my dad would grab the trash can and say, hey, Mr. Thompson, how you doing? 
for about 365 days for a year. He did that every day until finally one day, Mr. Thompson came over, apologized. Next thing you know, my dad and he, like I reported, were watching football games together. And that's how he was reformed was through, you know, communications. And I think that's part of the whole credo uh, of cybernetics. Peter, please. I, I think, um, again, I, I've been interested in, in tracking um, BLM and efforts to uh, reform the police and um, all that for several years. I, I think when people ask about support or opposition to BLM, there are different things that are meant. I think most of, um, maybe about two thirds of the population are in support of equality for African Americans and an end to this sort of brutality by the police and accountability on the part of the police. Probably uh, maybe a smaller fraction are in favor of street protests. Um, and, and even uh, another smaller fraction would be, uh, a much smaller fraction would be in favor of more militant confrontational protests with the police. I'm not in favor of those things. I think they're counterproductive. Um, but um, uh, unfortunately, for better or worse, BLM has become a shorthand for sort of civil rights or inequality. Um, but it's also a shorthand for, um, you know, the politics of resistance and methods of resistance like demonstrations and uh, other actions. So um, I was going to, the other point I was going to make is that um, there's an identity politics on the left. There are a bunch of identity politics on the left, depending upon different groups. Um, but there's also an identity politics on the right, and, and, and that's um, white identity politics. And that's how uh, Trump was able to win in 2016 and how he might win in, uh, 2000, in 2020. Um, and there's a, there's a problem with both kinds of identity politics. Uh, they're inherently tribalist and uh, they, they drive this sort of, uh, you know, my people versus your people or, and we have to find a way out of that, um, that of the, out of that dichotomy and think of ourselves as citizens uh, and equal citizens uh, with, with our first allegiance to uh, humanity and or American society and secondary allegiances to other groups that we might be a part of. So um, I don't know whether that's cybernetics per se, um, but um, I think we have to find a way out of the sort of tribalism that we're facing, or else we're going to have a civil war. Thank you. Uh, Stuart, you have something to Jamie say? Jamie has her hand up. I, I like, if I, if I may um, follow up a little. Go ahead. Uh, since uh, Lowell said um, cybernetics is perceptual, so um, I couldn't help but start thinking about uh, family systems. And I'm not sure whether that is also considered perceptual, but that is definitely Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead. And Dana went to the place of the lynching, like being a racist is one thing, but actually going and lynch someone is something else. Or, or like uh, uh, whatever, uh, uh, hanging him, whatever, binding him with a rope behind the pickup truck and, and go uh, driving. So I'm wondering what is it that makes people actually join a sort of activity and not speak up? So that brings up the, this issue of rituals and, and that brings me back to uh, Lowell because he he has studied, uh, I mean, or at least very familiar with rituals uh, across the lifespan. So something is happening uh, that young children are uh, initiated uh, in those rituals to, to kind of participate and, and not speak up. And, and that uh, this uh, a, a, a dividing line somewhere is that you actually kill someone and that that is maybe a, a way that we really need to focus on intervening because that is uh so so you have the ones who actually kill someone in a group but then you have all the other ones who never go so far but they still have this uh 
uh, a hatred in themselves or this very uh, divisive reasoning. And so uh, what is it that makes people actually join uh, that type of reasoning? And, and I think there's something very ritualistic about it. It's not just uh, that someone decides, oh, I'm going to be divisive. It's that, that there is some sort of a context. And so that, that is a way, uh, a place to intervene. And, uh, and I guess there are already programs in place that focus on bullying um, in, in kindergarten, so to say. Uh, and, and so that maybe that is a, a, a way to intervene. And on the second point, I would like to make as there's uh, two uh, streams of thinking going on. And one is rational or analytical and the other is emotional. And I think the resistance to Black Lives Matter is a lot of people that are hyper rational about it. And they totally forget what it is about. <laughs> so they, they go and develop game theoretic modeling to kind of prove uh, that every life matters. <laughs> and, and actually, I have a friend like that in Australia who the only thing he can do is make rational arguments to say that we will end up in a post racial society. And so, why, why don't we live at once in the post racial society? And, and just the whole discussion of uh, Black Lives Matter but you actually need to get there. And, and that is going to be an emotional process because that is all about emotions that need to be uh, reprogrammed. So, so that is not something uh, that we can really uh, rationally argue because we first need to go in our own emotional space uh, to, to really understand what is going on. And, um, so I, I just want to point that out that there is this two tracks uh, reasoning uh, that we uh, that we need to um, be aware of uh, uh, while we move forward. That that um, and that is maybe something that can help us engage other people to to help them see you're just purely rational in your argument. You you're just not getting what this is about. This is not about some ideal type society that's going to be there tomorrow. No, this is about the very real things that are happening on the day, on the ground today, that people are getting lynched, but, but it's not really called lynching because it's not supposed to exist today. And, and to make people think about it, that is actually really happening, it's just not reported. Um, all right, that's, I, I rest my okay. case. Just a quick comment, the lynching museum memorial in montgomery is a really moving place it has the feeling of a memorial to the holocaust uh well worth a trip um, bob Liza. wants to say something uh, bob. Hmm. let me apologize if i'm taking the conversation sideways but i believe that we not only need people that are mixing in groups, which the current economics doesn't do, mixing individually between races and so forth. But we also need to have um, race itself being a topic of conversation. And as part of this, I wanna tell a story. I'll try to make it relatively quick. I worked uh, in the late 60s for the Office of Economic Opportunity, the War on Poverty. And we had black people and white people working together. and. One day, and I, I sadly don't remember his name, I went up to a black friend and I held up my, I rolled back my sleeve and held up my arm like this and I indicated I wanted him to do the same. And so we put our arms together like this. And then I said, that's not black. That's sort of a, a dark dusty brown. And he said, well, that's not white. That's sort of a dirty looking pink brown, <laughs> pinkish brown. And we both agreed, what was all the fuss about anyway? So it was really a wonderful conversation. And that in, to get there, we, I had to be working, we had to be working in a place that had both black people and white people and presumably Hispanic so forth and so on. And um, we had to be willing to have race be a subject of conversation. And if I, we're working in a place where there was a large Hispanic population. And I was comfortable asking what the Mexican weather forecast was and had someone say, you are making a joke. It's chilly today and hot tamale. 
and that he did not take that in a bad way, then I knew that I, I would know that I was working in a place where we could have the conversations we're all hoping happen. Thank you. Bob, you just... I like your story. <laughs> Looks like, Bob. look look at the, the, the screen. Looks like I am the white. <laughs> I, I'm the only person white here. You guys I think are Bob, I think, uh, little pink. <laughs> I, think Bob, I think Bob just made the argument for third order cybernetics, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, the observed first order, the observing second, and, uh, and, and that certainly combines the two together. Uh, <laughs> oh, look, this is uh, tan. Oh, look, this is really brown. And, there's, <laughs> and uh, when it comes out, we're, we're, we're all some shade of brown. There is no such thing as, uh, you know, oh, black and black or white. It was and I've seen, I've seen, I've seen no one that looks like a Sears and Roebuck, Kenwood, Ken, you know, Kenmore uh, washing machine or Kenmore refrigerator white or typewriting, uh, typewriting paper white or, uh, uh, you know, or something like where black as charcoal. And while it really, it really uh, was a remarkable, we're all brown. Remarkable, Good observation. Third a remarkable order. moment which has stayed with me for for generations. Thank you. Third order. Hey. Thanks. Someday, um, maybe not in my lifetime, it, it, maybe in the distant future, but we will get beyond this whole language of skin color. I think it's yeah, very pernicious. No, from now on, you can start to say that Jason is the white guy here, <laughs> and uh, everybody yeah. else, and Peter is the uh, chocolate guy here. <laughs> everybody else. Yeah. Pink. <laughs> and you know, it, 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 this is not just language a... System. I want to observe also, this is not just a black and white matter. Someone asked me one day, are you a bigot? And I said, yes, I am. They said, well, who do, who, who do you not like? And I said, I don't like Nigerian cab drivers that don't pick me up when I try and get a cab at 10 o'clock at night in DC. So they can all kiss my ass because, you know, it's a black man, but I'm trying to get a cab and, and uh, they won't pick me up. It's because I'm black. So there's black on black you know, race on race racism right there. Or the guy that when Al Schneider and um, and my clients from Cleveland and Siler, we were doing big deals with the Yellow Pages for Dayton and building Dayton. They came to town and I took them to the Sheridan Carlton at 16th and K. And like the other cars lined up and this tall six foot eight or so African guy uh, was the head car parker or whatever you call it, you know, the person that greets you at the door. And we pulled up and I had a small Mercedes. And he said, I'm sorry, but we have no more parking spaces and no more valets. There are parking spaces within, or parking lots within the next three blocks. So I rolled up the windows and told Nick and Al, who were both white, I said, watch this. I said, we're gonna go park and then let's go back to the lobby and look through the shades and I bet she parks every car after me. And they did. Well, Al Schneider got so mad that he went to the manager of the Sheridan Carlton and said, this guy just discriminated against us. And he said, well, how? He said, the, the, you're saying Mr. Lewis is black and our uh, doorman is black. Uh, how, how could that be? They're both black. And, and that's when the argument started with Al and the manager of the Sheridan Carlton. Look, there's this thing called black on black racism. And if you don't realize it, you better realize it now. That black guy was not going to serve me because I was black, um, you know. And and uh, and then uh, when I had my cellular company, Cellular One, uh, they escalated an issue all the way up to me from this African guy that we hired, and he didn't know his ass from a hole in the ground. And we taught him IT, gave an opportunity, and then he moved uh, Alice Zakian, who was my vice president for marketing, and we had a very diverse company. People always complimented Cellular One saying, wow, you guys look like America. And it really did, because I wouldn't hire based on I'm going to have an all black company or we're going to cut just black hair and you know, or cut white hair. I've gone in barbershop. Oh, we don't, you know, sorry, but we don't cut black hair here. It's like, give me a break. And, <laughs> and, uh, but at any rate, so they said Phillips refused to work for Alice because she needed a, a demographic IT person in the department to run all the data for the uh, cellular systems to demonstrate need uh, from the surveys that we were doing. And uh, he refused to work for us. So it went all the way up the management level and got to the president and CEO, me, 
And uh, so I sat down with Phillips and told the exec VP I didn't need anyone in the office. So I said, so I understand you refuse to work for Alice because she's a woman. And uh, he said, that's correct. He said, in my country, I said, well, you're not in your country, you're in the United States. And we do have this thing called female vice presidents. And he said, well, I'm not working for a female. I said, okay, well, it's real easy for me. You're fired, okay? And by the way, Norma Brave Boy down in accounting has got your check, so go get it. And, uh, and then he started on a rant against me that started, number one, with the fact that I was not a true black because I was mixed with white and an Ameri African American. Therefore, you're not an authentic black man. And he said, and the reason that I'm superior over you and Africans are superior over you, Mr. Lewis, is because we demonstrate it all the time. He said, how come you think that we can hold our breath underwater longer? How come, you th how come we win all the races, the marathons? I said, well, first of all, I said, I'll run a marathon again, Shannon Dan, I'll whoop your ass. And that's number one. Number two, <laughs> you know, we, we can go to the swimming pool at Walter Reed Army Hospital, and I guarantee you that I'm going to hold my breath underwater longer than you. So if you think that being an African and having bigger nostrils than my wide nose is better or superior in some way, then you're out of your damn mind. So I said, beside that, I said, if you notice one thing, I'm sitting here behind this desk, and I'm the president and CEO. So how come you're not sitting here? And uh, so then I decided to harass him. And I said, you know, where you're from, I said, there are no buildings higher than a thatch roof hut. You don't have anything but dirt roads in Africa. And he said, that's not true. We have skyscrapers. I said, ah, get out of here like this. So I decided I'd apply the same thing to him to see his reaction. And, uh, and I said, well, I said, I value the time we've spent with you. And if you want your job back, you're gonna work as a volunteer for 30 days. So right now you're fired. You can go get your check from Norma down in accounting. And in 30 days, and, and if you're not here tomorrow at 7 p.m. And, 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 and here for 12 hours until 7 p.m. every day, including Saturday and Sunday, then you might, we may, we may put this position up for rehire in 30 days. So he worked with no pay and I, I pulled my military commander stuff and I <laughs> paid him, you know, made him work without pay. And uh, he came back and I saw him on the escalator at Farragut North here a couple years ago. And he thanked me for firing him for 30 days and making him work. And he said it really jolted him as to the fact that the archaic nature of the thinking uh, in a lot of African tribes and people were very backwards. I said, well, you're welcome. And now he's very successful in IT in the DC area. And, uh, but, you know, he'll then translate that. But it's not just, uh, you know, whites on blacks or blacks. Mm -hmm. it, it happens within race, too. And that's one of the things that we never discuss. But I just wanted to bring that point out and now shut up. That is purely cybernetics. It's all in the mind. Stuart, you want to say something before we do the final run of the conclusion? Part? No, I don't, I don't have anything else to add. <laughs> okay, so number four. Number four is about decision making. Uh, what have I learned from everything above and what I'm going to do to share with the group? Jamie, you want to stop? No, no song. No song. Okay, uh, I'd like to uh, give it a pass for now. I, I need some more uh, reflection, I guess. Need, so need to do more reflection as a decision itself. Okay. Um, so, yes, uh, what have I learned? Well, uh, I have learned I'm definitely going to continue with the Clock of Remy. I'll make sure I participate uh, in every presentation because I have a feeling um, I'm uh, with a, a, a group of people uh, that I'm um, that I'm uh, that I think as a as a as a group of individuals uh, that we somehow will stick together and and do something that's going to be really maybe transformative and. Um, and I have learned, um, yeah, I don't know how else to say this. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the middle. 
Of course, I, I have limitations in my own thinking. And uh, if I may say that bluntly, my challenge was to find other people that were able to work with my limitations. And, and I've had uh, trouble finding a group of people like that um, to be constructive moving forward. And, and so that's what I've learned. Um, mm. Peter. Uh, Peter, uh, I mean, I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Can other Peter go ahead? Peter. No, I think it's you. Oh, both. I, I don't know. Okay, you, you, you guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, can you just uh, repeat your levels? The first one is what. The second one is emotions and feelings. What is three? Analysis. Three is so what? It's analysis. So, analysis so what? what kind of a, all kinds of a reasoning going on that uh, you have your uh, your own okay. theory, your your hypothesis, and, your experience. And then, and then four one, is action. What to do? Yeah, this last be one done. is action. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, on the number four, what happened to so what? <laughs> is that part of number four? Oh, well, that's number three. Uh, so still what is number three? It's, it's okay, so what? Okay. From your well, okay, that's not how I interpret so what. But anyway, okay, so now what? All right, thank you. <laughs> now what? <laughs> and uh, Laura? What has impressed me is the level of understanding by sharing personal stories. And this particularly with Zoom, is non-threatening because we are divorced in one sense. And so the ability to explore your own emotions with someone else, uh, and I don't have to share a beer with you, but I'm sharing a Zoom meeting with you. And so this needs to be replicated uh, as a conversation across this country. Uh, you know, with diverse groups to be talking about white privilege, whether it be black uh, oppression uh, syndrome, whatever it is, we need to get it out and doing your levels is one technique to do that. But it's a conversation. It's not a book report. It's not a, a, a get together to shoot the bull. It's how am I to see the world differently and what are my limitations, as Jamie said, and what can I learn from someone else? So what are the formats that would uh, facilitate that is what my takeaway is. So what? Okay, Peter. The other uh, Peter. <laughs> yeah. Which one is the other? Am I the other how one? Do I, how do I distinguish you two guys? How about you know, I'll be Peter too. To say why don't black? How the Peters, do? the Peters, uh, the Peters uh, reign superior because there are two of us and only one of each of you. So we get the vote if any votes come out today on what to do. So as we enter into that subject, um, the um, my you know comments kind of go back to what Lowell said. You know about uh, he was happy to see that a lot of shared stories were shared, but uh, you know I. Um, um, I, I really enjoyed the uh, the two sessions. Sorry, I couldn't do two hours on the first one. That's why it was kind of short, and we're having a second one. Um, but yeah, I think the stories, uh, just like with market research or anything else, it, you, 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 it starts with a good guess insofar as solutions. Um, when you're doing market research, what do you charge for cellular per month? Um, you know, you got to ask people. You got to have a gut and say, "Well, I should sell this." big pen here for $2.39. Uh, maybe that's the wrong price. Maybe that's not what the market will bear. But we're talking about here a different kind of bearing, you know, what will society bear uh, insofar as defining what Black Lives Matter is and how we proceed. Um, I talked about in my original presentation and in my summary today uh, about what I think are some solutions. And uh, it's not just, and, and, and I think what I was trying to say at the end is where Black Lives Matter has turned into, it's morphed into something different than the what the original founders had thought. Uh, and I said uh, uh, 30 minutes ago or so that it, it's morphed into equality for everybody. Now, how do you propagate that out to the masses? 
uh, I'm not sure, but one thing, you know, when we uh, look at the age of internet, it started with personal computer, um, and then it went into social networking was the second evolutionary stage. And now we're at device connectivity with the internet of things and things of that nature where management and machines can collaborate within the cloud to make decisions on a, 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 a signal light at the corner of Fifth and Main Street that just burnt out. Well, before it would be blinking red on all four corners and there'd be chaos for six hours. And now with Internet of Things, it just notifies a manager within 10 seconds. The traffic light is out at the corner of Fifth and Main. And here's specifically the module that burnt out. So bring a new one and get it repaired within 30 minutes. So uh, things change as a result of that. Well, in like manner, you know, we have to be able to respond quickly. Uh, to things now and, and instead of letting them linger. And that should be one of the things that we're leveraging nowadays in society is using the internet and using that to our advantage uh, in, in order to make changes, uh, not just marching, not just busting class in and looting uh, or you know, any of those methods that we talked about are good or bad to get the attention the, that BLM um, means. But, 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 but I think it's important to define and that's what I'm seeing a lack of out here in social media and what no one's really defined what Black Lives Matter has morphed into. And I think that by doing so, that would change the mindset of a lot of people that look at BLM as a threatening um, movement uh, to say, look, th this is a movement for Peter, for Valerie, for Stuart, uh, for, for Jamie, uh, Jimi Hendrix there and, and uh, you know, and everybody. Uh, it's a movement for women, uh, and like uh, Jamie, it's yes. women, women that wear glasses, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, we, we have a little bit of a handicap, so she and I, find, all right. you know, and, uh, but, but, uh, but if we don't leverage all these tools that we have out here uh, to make a change, you know, then really where have we gone, and that's why I'm saying, I think the conclusion of all these great people on this session today has somehow got to be written up and it's got to get get propagated out here, even if it's just to a few people. It's that you know few that 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 subset of that few that sub universe that may be threatened by BLM. They're then going to change their minds and say, "Oh, that's what it is." That's my conclusion. Thank you, Peter. I, I, I you know I I do think that it's. Um, uh, the universalism of, of the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King, uh, that's where I would like things to go. But um, Black Lives Matter, the organization itself, I've looked at their website and I read it and it's really about black power. So it's got a explicitly um, black nationalist agenda. Um, I think probably most people don't know that and and we and we all support it because it's it's it has started out dealing with the problem of police killing uh, minority people and other other people uh, uh, and um, and it's sort of it's and and it morphed into uh, this um, well they were always doing protests but their protests became much more effective with the killing of uh, Floyd um, and. Um, and and now there's a, a, a larger discussion about where to go. You know, there are discussions about reparations and discussions about um, uh, all sorts of other things. Um, but um, what's missing from that whole discussion, uh, uh, which is based on critical race theory, uh, is the sort of universalist, uh, egalitarian, non-identitarian, uh, view of civil rights as, as universal rights for everyone. Uh, and, and so what I worry about is that, um, is that this um, kind of particularism uh, will uh, short circuit the, the, um, the universality of, 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 of a movement. Because there isn't really a movement for, for equality per se or getting beyond race, that would be condemned as, um, 
but that would be condemned by the critical race people as uh, as ignoring the problem. Um, so, so okay. Uh, let me let me say a few words because uh, uh, Laura has a presentation to do after we conclude this round of conversation. Uh, and, okay. and, uh, uh, as a facilitator, I have a disadvantage of speaking for myself. So, so now I took off my imaginary facilitator cap, put it aside, and coming back to Jason myself, and I will say a little thing about uh, this forerun reflection that I should have. Uh, the data side, I still remember uh, Laura used uh, the phrase, it's the system stupid. Uh, and in the same time, uh, in the same session, and uh, uh, Jamie used the word, uh, the clueless, the clueless class. And uh, those are some kind of a red flag for me, uh, because, because I'm very nervous on two sides. On one side, I'm nervous about our intellectuals uh, falling into the trap of what uh, Hayek said called the fatal conceit, that if we become so uh, confident about our knowledge and our wisdom about the world, we may eventually turn into some negative force for the society. Uh, on the other side, I have, I have been alerted by uh, the, the videos and the images that I shared with you on our clouds folder that uh, was kind of disturbing to me because, because I think I come from a different society than your guys. So the major difference between me and all of you is that some of you might consider this United States society a bad one, needs to be overthrown, need a revolution. Better Trump drop that immediately. So I cannot agree with that uh, because I come from a much worse society. So I cherish this society so much that I don't want to see it being hurt. So, so particularly to Peter, I understand uh, your story and uh, your experience of being uh, discriminated and those emotional hurt and drama, uh, the, the, the traumas. But uh, we need another session that you and I can exchange our emotional experiences that uh, I could have a chance to tell you stories that compared with what happening in that kind of a society, uh, China, Soviet Union, and uh, Cambodia, and, and, and really what you being wrongly treated was really small case. I mean, for you, it's emotional and it's bitter, but, uh, but uh, if you compare to the other kind of a society, and uh, you will see from my perspective that uh, why uh, this is not a bad society. This is just oh, not absolutely good enough. Totally agree with you. And, uh, and again, okay. like I said, I'm, I'm not bitter. I don't carry a, a chip on my shoulder at all because I've seen it on both sides. Like I said before, yeah, we, this confusing time in my life is when we moved from Europe to the United States and, and I got a taste of the U.S. And uh, over there, it was more curiosity about blacks, but we didn't get overt racism against us. My dad sometimes would be asked, can we touch your hair? a German national, and he'd bend down and say, sure. That happened on the first day we arrived. We were staying at a guest house waiting for our military quarters, and each person then discussed it in German, and then the next person touches it. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was curiosity. We'd stop at the stoplight, 
you know, on Mimigenstrasse or whatever, and everyone would be staring at us, and we had a game in our family. All right, on the count of three, one, it's to the left, one, two, and we'd all look to the left real quick, and they'd all be staring at us, and we'd look straight. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we had fun, but here, it was a totally different thing, and, and uh, I've, everywhere I've been, France, England, uh, the islands, uh, and so forth, Japan, you know, it's uh, when, 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 when I see news reporters on TV today, like Bruce Johnson and others that, you know, felt before they started the news as an anchor, they had to talk about their experience in Japan. And uh, the owner of a bathhouse saying, please don't come back because my customers said that they won't come back if a black man uses the bathhouse again. He just wanted to experience it. And they were all walking out and he thought it was just the end of the session but they were leaving because he was in the water with them. And, uh, you know, so you hear these kind of things, you see these kind of things, and you go back to the good old USA, despite George Wallace types, despite, you know, uh, what we see and whatnot, it's still the best. Uh, and that's great, but it can always be made better. So yeah, 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 yeah. So we, our black we, lives, we man. Know, it can so always be made be better. better too. And, uh, you know, Trump's corruption and, and abasement of rule of law and democracy is making us more like the Chinese right now. So that's the other perspective. Uh, we don't want a revolution. We, we, we want to improve things, but we want to go back to something more normal in terms of American uh, institutions and practices. Um, so, oh, yeah. Peter, if I may just bring this up or amplify what you say, and we could do another session about this, but you're pointing out this identity politics, uh, how that really has taken off, and it's all over the place, and, and how uh, can we contain that? And, and there's also specifically a question to Peter Lewis, in, in that you haven't really discussed too much identity politics, but... Um, something that uh, Jason and I have also talked about that. Uh, how, this is because it's politics on both the right and the left. We're going to another session. We're going to another yeah. session. Yeah.